and we are live. Natasha, so lovely to get to meet you and speak to you finally. Hello, Simon. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, well, um, I've been a fan from a distance from a long time. Um, so I, I, I remember seeing you at, um, I'm going to say Basing State Live a while ago, and I saw you on some little bit involved with, with the organisation. I was so, I've, I've seen you from a distance. I've seen you perform. It's a real delight. And I love your voice. It's a beautiful, really incredible voice. And uh, I've just thought, God, it'd be great if I could have a chat with you. So it's, I feel really lucky and privileged today. You are very lucky because you are in my woman cave. <laughs> <laughs> Talk us around. This, this is my narcissistic, I have to say that, because what happened, this is my garage. <laughs> and I used to just put my posters on the ceiling um, as a way of just like when I come in the garage, you know, to go to the fridge or, or whatever, you know, it kind of just reminds me of, of you know, what, what I've achieved. And then lockdown happened. Now I had a fully functioning office office in the house <laughs> which is through that door um, but then of course with lockdown my husband had to start working from home so I was very politely kicked out of said office <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> and I subsequently I, I, I got some I got um, a breakfast bar and I had a breakfast bar put up and I put shelves up and I literally moved everything out of there into now my new narcissistic cave which actually I've got more work done in here than I did in the house because what happens in the house is you get disturbed or you get asked where's food or have you done this or the doorbell goes so actually when I'm out here and I shut the door it's great I've, I've really got a lot of work done so yeah we joke about it being my narcissistic cave but it is covered in pictures of me <laughs> uh, they, the great pictures as well they are all on the ceiling too are they? show us around a little bit <laughs> Well, it's just, it's very narcissistic. Um, right, what have we got? We've got... Um, show, show us some of the pictures and talk, talk us through them, maybe maybe what happened, because this is also a point of inspiration, right? All the great things that you've achieved, you know, all the yeah. people you sang with. Well, this is my 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 favourite picture ever. It's my picture... Oh, sorry. There's <laughs> another, another fan calling you. No, it's, it's linked up, but... Um, Please take the phone call. He's not taking the phone call. I have to press it. I pressed it. Okay. Um, he's taking it. Um, All right. <laughs> sorry, I'm on my husband's computer because, as you know, we had a few um, technical issues. So his phone is connected to his, this computer. That's hilarious. <laughs> I completely trust him. <laughs> I, I just think, they're, they're, listen, I, I would have found that a different way and said, listen, this is someone else, it's my agent, they're calling, got another booking, one second, it's going to step off. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. So, um, yes, yeah, so this room is, is full of my little, little what, what, mobile. What, what was that picture you were showing us? Oh, this was, let me pick it up, it'll be a lot easier. I actually posted it the other day on social media. I thought I saw that, yeah. Great story behind this. So this, wrong side, this, <laughs> I'm all back to the front. Uh, this was written to me uh, by Gladys. I can't, can't really see that. Um, yeah, I can see it's from Gladys, yeah. Back in 1994, wow. uh, when I lived in America. So a long time ago, a very long time ago, <laughs> and she was opening up for Frankie Beverly and Mays. Now, Frankie and Beverly and Mays are a huge soul um, group from the States with massive soul anthems. And she was their opening act. And I was currently living with uh, Rome Lowry, who is the percussionist and one of the original members from Mays. And I was living in the States with him. And so I was kind of bring, brought along to the show and I, I was in awe of Gladys Knight anyway. So she wrote on this for me here, which, uh, wrong side again. So it just says, uh, to Natasha, thanks for your support, love from Gladys. Yeah, great, lovely, kept Incredible. it. And then roll forward to 2015, and I am delighted to say that I was asked to be Gladys's opening act. So that's some 20 odd years later. And uh, I got to do nine shows up and down the UK from the Royal Albert Hall to Birmingham Symphony to Glasgow to the Bournemouth Bic. It was epic. It was yeah. one of the best tours of my life, playing to tens of thousands of people. And this one says, uh, to Natasha, you have grown into a very beautiful young lady and I am more than, I can't read that bit. 
and more than that you have a beautiful spirit may god continue to bless you and yours love sharing the stage with you uh as always love gladys that's incredible that is amazing isn't it i've never do you know that brought a tear to my eyes oh gosh it it nearly did mine (laughs) i've never read that out to anybody i've kept it really like private but that's probably my most treasured possession because you know when you think about the fact that 1995 i wasn't even singing um i ended up having my son in 1996 so the timeline was really tight Mm. and you know to then open up for this lady that i adored so much i think that's pretty special it's incredible it's incredible yeah wow maybe 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 what we should do then is we should talk about the timeline from those early days that you had in America when you went off across yeah. all the way up to when you got to sing with Gladys back in 2000. Yeah. And yeah. So I think, I think we should go through that because I think one of the great, one of the great things about chatting to you and what I love the most, I love music. So, yeah. and you love music. And so it's just, it's just when two people get to sit and chat about music, I know we'll, we'll probably ramble all day, which, which hopefully people will find entertaining. <laughs> what, so, so where, where did your initial love and passion for music come from when, when you were very, very young? Oh gosh, right. So I am what is commonly known as the Ready Brett Kid. My sister gave me that nickname from, do you remember the Ready Brett advert from years ago? I think so. And, it would glow on the way to school. And oh, like, yes. Oh, he's had his ready brick. Yes, and that was it. He's had his ready bricks. Yeah. Ready brick. So my sister called me the ready brick kid because purely because I literally was glowing all the time. I was like cartwheeling down the corridors. I couldn't, I just couldn't sit still. I was back bending and roly poling and flip flapping and all sorts of stuff. And it was just, I just never ever stopped. And I started dancing dance classes I lived on you know I lived in Oak Ridge it's council estate always Oak Ridge and um, <laughs> <laughs> and I you know there was a, a Dames Mead is a social club and you know it was kind it was it was the hub of the the local community you know and they had dance classes running out of there a couple of nights a week and you know I my, I badgered my mum to do it and we didn't have a lot of money we, you know to this day I am so grateful that my mum I don't know what she did <laughs> I'm sure it couldn't have been legit but she definitely put me through dance school um not only because obviously it made me very happy but you know I was I was pretty good at it, you know. I, I mean, nothing like the dancers of today. To dance today would have wiped the floor with me. But in my day, you know, you did a double pirouette and you thought you was doing really good. So, you know, I was sent off to do the dance classes, and I really, I really enjoyed it, and I excelled at it, and you know, it really kept me on a good path. And I think that was a ha- half of the battle as well, because at school I wasn't very good. I, I really. I wasn't cut out for school and you know not everybody is um and it wasn't that I was naughty although I got labeled as naughty it was just I was I was bored Mm. I didn't I didn't want to sit there I didn't want to I you know I didn't have a great understanding of reading and you know um so dancing kept me really really focused it was the one thing I could excel at you know and there'd be competitions you know every month we'd go somewhere else and compete and I'd always get medals in fact I was sorting my garage out over this lockdown because you know we all had nothing to do so <laughs> everybody's pants got organized and color coordinated and <laughs> brilliant <laughs> my um my I I did I'm a bit of an organizer and everything got organized and and I went through the garage and I think like everybody else did on this estate but I went through the garage and I found my box of trophies and uh, medals and I've kept every certificate and I, I'm not joking I've got a stack of certificates this high really and all, all from all from dancing every you know every single performance competition exam I did I've kept every bit of paper and I was reading through them and I was like oh my god you know I I loved it I clearly loved it but the schooling was just you know just wasn't my my bag and I'm not ashamed to say but I left school I left school at 30 well 
Um, no, I'm not ashamed to say it. I got kicked out of school. At 13, <laughs> really? Gosh. At 13. And, you know, I never really got back into it because also the problem is that schools then, they, once you're labelled, you're labelled. There's no, there was no sort of like coaching or, you know, understanding. It was like, no, she's naughty, get rid of her. So at the age of 13, I was sort of out of school and then they put me in a mother and baby unit and I'm like I didn't have a baby um oh, yeah. that's where they put me and that didn't work and you know and, and then you kind of you know and it's not an excuse but you do get kind of a chip on your shoulder you're like I just I'm just not cut out for sitting there and you know learning about stuff that oh, I just I'm not interested in and I know that sounds really bad but I just knew myself that wasn't my strength, you know, but stick me on a stage and I excelled. So yeah. why couldn't they understand that? Why couldn't they harness that? Or, you know, let's put her in drama or let's, let's, you know, d get her doing something. I don't know. Anyway, there wasn't the encouragement. Um, I couldn't read and write properly. Um, I didn't really learn to read and write properly until I was in my twenties, actually. Really? Wow. Yeah. I didn't didn't really have a clue um and you know it was quite easy to blag it you just go oh i've i've got dyslexia or you know <laughs> or you do something but I, I i taught myself by reading i got into reading books so that is how i taught myself and i still love to read books my kindle is around here somewhere mm. So, so what yeah. stage? Because if you were always performing, so when you won all the awards and everything at school from from that was that predominantly from dance or was that or was that singing as well? Yeah. All dance, All dance. Okay. and that yeah, was because you were so energetic and you dance. wanted to get out and dance and everything. Yeah, I had a lot of energy then. I'm really not sure where it's gone now. It's like I was saying the other day, I think my metabolism's gone like emigrated to some other country somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work like it used to. But no, it was it was all dance. There was a little bit of singing, musical theatre, but that wasn't. Although I was strong at it, that wasn't the road I wanted to take it was I was a dancer I just wanted to be chorus line I wanted to be in musicals I wanted to be in cats I wanted to be in the oh, cavity wow. in cats that, yeah, was imagine that. that was that was my dream so you know once I was 16 I was like yeah I'm gonna do this and I remember a week after my 16th birthday I got a job um, on a holiday park oh, and great. I left and I went to a holiday park and it wasn't it wasn't dancing or skiing, it was pretend but red coats. It was a pretend red coat because the company was born leisure. It wasn't even, wasn't Butlins, it wasn't anything reputable. <laughs> and I went to a, this holiday park in All Hallows in Kent. I'll never forget it. So I was a week after my 16th birthday and I couldn't have turned up at a more racist campsite in <laughs> any country. Oh, gosh. I, I promise you, it was such an eye opener because, you know, in Basingstoke, although you experienced a bit here and there, on the whole, I didn't re I wasn't really exposed to it. Mm. Um, whereas I went there, and this was Kent, but it was just just on the edge of Kent. You know, All Hallows is like the closest place for South Londoners. Now, as luck would have it, my whole family are from South London and they're white. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened in the first couple of weeks of being on this campsite and being called the N word, uh, oh, B really? word. Yeah. Like, because they were, they were like, they were like Millwall supporters, Millwall supporters. Yeah, <laughs> that's harsh. They were like proper. And I, I remember having a conversation with my uncle who still lived in South, South East. And I, I rung him up and I said, do you know this person? And he was like, yeah, I know it. Cause my uncle drove skips. He was really in the know. He knew a lot of people. And I said, do you know this person? He went, yeah, I know that person. I said, can you have a word then? Cause this particular person, I'm not going to say the name. He sort of ran the club. He was the, the top family, if that's the right choice of words, you know. And my uncle knew him and my uncle rung him up. And, and from then on, I was treated like a queen. Wow. 
just like that. But I was 16, wet behind my ears, couldn't even cook. I was eating cereal every day. I mean, I just, you know, I, I know I'm going right into detail now, but yeah, it's that was the beginning of like, oh, okay, this is all right. You know, we didn't really entertain. I was just kind of looking after the kids club and it was a good taster. And then the following year, I took on a proper job for the same company, but as entertainment so i managed yeah. to get in as singer dancer and we was doing shows you know this was down in wales in a place called tenby which is still one of my favorite places in in the world and um yeah i went down there and i was performing um but i got glandular fever and i got sent home oh nice so, so, yeah. so that so that um, that was almost the beginning of the crossover from from dance over into yeah. to you beginning to sing just a little bit well, I, I tell you where the, the actual poignant moment happened is they asked me to sing a song and I was like very reluctant um, with the band, you know, this very, when I look back, it was so jeez, but um, <laughs> it was, the, it was Bette Midler's Wind Beneath My Wings right. and this is how old it was. They recorded it on tape cassette, right? <laughs> and I, and it was that, I think it was that defining moment because I had a stand innovation and I'd never had that. Wow. And I, I got a copy of the tape and I sent it to my mum and my mum still had it when she passed 13 years ago. And I've got it somewhere here now, still got the, 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 the tape and my mum used to play it to everybody. And I think it was that point. Yeah, definitely. That was the poignant moment that was like, Oh, actually, I can sing, you know. Um, yeah, I'll have to dig that out. Yeah, um, gosh. On YouTube or something. Get it yeah, got it. Tape or something. But that, yeah, that'd be amazing. I, yeah. Think, I think that that. Yeah, I. Oh, we lost. We've gone a bit robotic. A little bit robotic um, there, but so so you feel so that was like the pointy moment when you had when you you performed. You had a standing ovation at that moment. Yeah. You must have think, wow, this this is something. I, this, this is something I've got here. But you didn't really necessarily think about it before then. No, I didn't. And what happened? So I came home with the glandular fever. And, um, and then I, my mum was like, oh, are you going to go back? And what happens you, when you get homesick and then you come home, you don't want to go anywhere because mm. it's like, you know, and I'm still really young. I'm, I'm like a baby. My baby is 24 this year and I, <laughs> I don't even think he's capable of living by the road. So how I did it, I don't know. But... Then I came back and I started to audition for um, West End. I went up to a couple of West End like auditions and I didn't even get to sing because I'm only five foot one. What, so, they, what, so, so when you got there to sing, what, so they didn't, didn't give you, you the had opportunities to, or? Yeah, you had to be between five foot six and five foot seven for chorus line. It's changed a lot now, but then they were very, you know, you had to be same height. So, and I didn't believe in myself enough to go just to sing. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm chorus, you know, cause I'm young. I didn't, you know, I didn't believe that I could achieve that. So I, I kind of got rejected before I'd even opened wow. my mouth. The op- and- well, it's unbelievable, isn't it? That they just said, right, no, because you're, you're not tall enough, but no. that they didn't have the opportunity to hear you sing, which could completely change their minds. Yeah. It's, 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 I mean, it just that's been, it's already begins to show what a tough industry this is. Don't even have the opportunity oh, no. to show your ability. Yeah. And the competition wasn't even as fierce then as it is now. I mean, the world and their mother want to be a performer now or a footballer or something else. So, you know, then it was, there was only, there was a handful. So yeah, I didn't stand a chance. And then that's when I decided to try and, you know, go down the route of just being a singer. And that's when I hooked up with um, a few producers and, this one producer hooked me up with Rome and that's how I ended up getting flown to America. So. Let's, let, let's, let's talk through how all that happened because, because, because you're, you're young at this, this stage, I'm going to say teens, 18, 19, 17, something like that. 17. Yeah. Seven, 17. So you're 17. You've sort of just left the holiday camp and then you've gone for some auditions. It didn't not quite worked out. How do you then get, get almost in contact with these types of producers, even that early on? Like how did you make those contacts? Well, there was a, there was also another trip in between that. Um, so I came back from the campsite, tried some West End stuff, didn't work, uh, reached out for some music stuff, 
got a contract to go and dance, just dance in Italy. Oh. Uh, that was that was a calamity of errors as well. Me and my friend Rachel flew out there. Um, <laughs> when I say it, when I say it out loud, actually, it's quite it's still quite bad because we turned up and they, my friend's blonde and I'm not, and we turned up and the the lady was like, she's black, but in my pictures clearly I didn't look black. <laughs> <laughs> she was quite shocked and it's only looking back in hindsight I think oh yeah she probably had a problem with that but anyway we went out there to dance Latin American I've never danced Latin American but hey I've got rhythm we can work this out and we was only there for like four months in the end three months something like that because it where they wanted to put us once we realized was a strip club so we came home wow what a job <laughs> we came home and I was like I'm not doing that. And then we came home. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm surprised to see that that wasn't written on your bio. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, live and let live. I mean, you know, we, we've all done stuff that is, is probably very close to the mark. So, yeah. you know, I'm all for everybody doing whatever it is they need to do. I condone anything, you know, get your money however you need to get it. But I wasn't about to do that in Italy. No. So, and I was only 17 I was under age so um so we flew back very quickly because once they realized we wasn't going to go and work in the club and I remember the club it was called Tuva and it was in Torino and it was right. it was not a it was a scary place yeah, it was a, it was. and I'm 17 very wet behind the ears I'm like get me out of here and so then I went into the producers and I think it was around about the October that I left and went to the States. So that had been a full year of all sorts of stuff. And um, I ended up spending the Christmas of 94 in America. So how did you, so how did the, the America come about? And what was that, what was the purpose of the trip? And then what actually happened when you got there? Cause I know that, that was quite a journey, wasn't it? Yeah, the purpose of the trip was to go and work on music and hone my craft. Um, the reality was a little bit different. Um, part of my trip was I had to be an au pair, um, which was great. I met these great kids and I met a, a lady I worked with who I'm still friends with today. And she was the one who wanted to push me more once she realized I could actually sing because her moment came when we went to a karaoke and I was like, Ah, and I blurted out like I think I blurted out like a Whitney Houston song and then she managed to get me signed to a management company wow. out there. Uh, and I came oh how did I can't remember the exact time but I came home for a short while and then I went back again and I I got the part I got a part in a musical um with an American director called David E. Ta David E. Talbot and uh the gospel group Kirk Franklin and the family were the choir in this musical. So I got to sing with them. I got to learn, you know, all sorts about myself, about the, the industry, about singing. I mean, these were real gospel singers. This was, I'd never heard gospel before. I'd never experienced gospel. And I remember like, you know, watching these, like these, these big women just like effortly belting out. And that gave me like, the like the idea to be this more of a belter um and and push my vocals you know because I hadn't really you don't really know you don't really know and uh yeah it was it was great anyway so Clarence a guy called Clarence was my now manager and he wanted me to change my spelling of my surname to a z what's I, don't, I just remember this conversation it's, it's, a bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit American isn't it yeah. Very American. And um, he invited me to um, sing for various people. And off the back of this, I got to meet Michael Molden, who at the oh. time was the head of AR at Columbia, New York. So we're in talks for record labels. I mean, they're sending cars for me. Um, I met Mary J. Blige, TLC, Jodeci. You know, I'm hanging out at the Mayfair Hotel. It was mental. Oh, that is unreal. And they're talking about me signing to Columbia, New York, you know, this new protege, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know I was pregnant. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, 
so and and again my naivety like after we'd had all these meetings and they'd sent me on photo shoots and you know we're we're talking a deal this is going to happen um sony was dealing with it in this com- com- uh, country a guy called oh what was his name Matt someone and he was really great and he was like yeah they're gonna sign you da 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 I had to get lawyers and find a lawyer and all this kind of stuff and then I was like yeah yeah it's fine but anyway I'm pregnant and literally within 24 hours it was next just so so they just cancelled the deal they just canned it unbelievable isn't it and gone disappeared hello hello <laughs> then no one's answering <laughs> just done gone yeah wow. Wow. so that was uh that was that was sad but at the same time how, how did you deal with it at the time because of course if you're hanging out with these cool people you're thinking i'm just about to sign with sony you know you're beginning you're right you're right at the cusp of it you're, you're, you're the, right at that moment and then how did you feel in the moment because you, you must have also been Oh, I'm going to have a child. That's a great thing. And then, and then how, how were you in the moment? Um, do you know what? I think I handled it really well because mm. like, you know, I had someone that relied on me and I wasn't about to not live up to my responsibilities. That was my responsibility. And, you know, um, of course there's, there's, there's options, yeah. but that, that wasn't, that wasn't an option. For me and you know from the second I knew that I had a child in my belly I was in love with it yeah um to be honest and I am still besotted with it <laughs> <laughs> him yeah. yeah um quite a few yeah. years later now yeah I mean you know my literally my career stopped overnight because you know my relationship broke down literally overnight as well um and i found myself without a deal <laughs> without a home <laughs> without a partner wow. all in the space of like two months just because yeah. they just because because you announced that you're pregnant mm. wow I wasn't to hide it. yeah i wasn't gonna hide that no. anyway because you can't hide it you know um and i wouldn't have felt right hiding it so you know i then had to life took on a very different meaning i had to change tact i had to um get a job i remember getting a i think i got a job in a bar um i had to find somewhere to live because um in all of this i'd sort of burnt my bridges a little bit with my parents because they were very much against me you know moving in with somebody and having a child and all this kind of stuff and i was very headstrong Mm. very headstrong you know um but it just made me very independent. So I literally found somewhere to live and I got my first ever, I got a little one bedroom flat. I think I must've been about, so I must've been about August. So I must, I, you know, like three months, four months pregnant, something like that. So did you, um, so did you, did you come back to the UK or did you, were yes, you in the UK? Sorry, yeah, I was back uh, in the UK. So, so, yeah. so that, that sort of broke down, you came back to the UK and, and just set up camp here effectively. Yeah, well, the, the father was English. So um, yeah, so it was, the right thing to do to come back anyway and um yeah just I remember getting my 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 first little flat and in Popley in Popley (laughs) oh right brilliant and I I literally had nothing and I remember going to this like women's refuge and she had um a couple of garages at the back of this this house it was a it was a um children's home and women's refuge and she was just this really great lady and she basically said look go to the garages there was two garages you can help yourself to whatever it is you need um all we need is a donation for the delivery you know it was there to help young mums and because i was 18 you know i was a young mum um and needed support and you know i've never been surrounded by money all all my family we've all worked really hard so there wasn't spare cash anywhere for anyone it's you know there was no one to lean on um and so I remember getting this, getting this like table and chairs and I got this bed and, you know, and it was like a second hand mattress, maybe even third or fourth hand. I don't know. But it was a really nice mattress, but I was freaked out that it was somebody else's mattress. And I remember I put like four sheets over it. 
<laughs> before I would actually get in it. But, um, but it really served, it served me so well. I had it for years and I had this table and I painted it and, you know, I got all my kitchen stuff and, you know, times were really hard. Like I had no job t- to speak of, you know, in the end I ended up having to go on to the welfare system um, just to get by because by then I was heavily pregnant and no one's going to employ you when you're heavily pregnant. So, you know, and I remember there was at one point because they said, Oh, you know, I'd made myself unemployed that I was getting 42 pounds a fortnight. That was it. Right. 42 pounds a fortnight. Gosh, I don't know how people live. Yeah. But you do, you, you know, I, I, the market, the, do you remember the bottom, I don't know if you remember, the bottom market in Basingstoke, you know, they had lots of fruit and veg stores. And if you went there on a Wednesday, you could always get really good deals and the meat market and, you know, and that would be it. You'd go to the market, like a proper market. They don't do that now. <laughs> and you could haggle and get more stuff and, you know, eke it out and, you know, and Make you just work. survive. Let's get you, by. Yeah, you survive. And I ended up from that flat, I ended up moving to um, o- o- back to Oak Ridge, but to um, they had Masonettes in Oak Ridge. They've gone now. They've knocked them down. They were that bad. But at the time, it was the only way for me to get a council property because I was in private. My first place was private. And of course, I remember it was like £370 a month. That's not a lot, is it? It's not a lot of money. No, gosh. <laughs> no. And um, anyway, I, I still couldn't have afforded that with a job. So I, I ended up taking a masonette and that was £55 a week. Yeah. God. <laughs> I don't even know how I remember that. But then I, you know, I was in there, I think, a couple of months. By the time Taylor was about six months, I'd managed to get a job at the care home, which was next door to the masonette and that's it and then i've worked ever since so so so, so really during that time while you is it mason you said sorry yeah so, so while, while you you had, taylor, had taylor. taylor sorry yeah. sorry while, while, you, while you had taylor sorry i don't know where that came from um so while you had taylor so you you, you put the singing on hold the dancing hold and said right you've got to you know you, of course you, you were having a ha- having a mace um Having Taylor, sorry. <laughs> having Taylor, Taylor in the masonette. <laughs> <laughs> having Taylor in the masonette, I've got it. Yeah. And so, yeah. so you just you thought, right, that's got to, that's on hold now, right? I'm just yeah. going to have, going to start the family, and yeah. then, but you still had that ambition. But you just thought yeah, maybe, listen, I'll revisit this later on. I've got other priorities right now. I'll revisit it later on. Yeah, you have to, you have to prioritise. And one thing with music, it's you're not known for making money. Um, <laughs> we do music for love a lot of the time, and yeah you just there's a different set of responsibilities and you have to go with it you know but it never like I said it never goes I was always always singing whether it's down the pub or you know if there was a karaoke oh yeah I was on it you know mm. um because it's it's that innate performance that you you need to do but yeah I didn't really do anything again musically until I did like well I said didn't I did the I tried to do the odd thing but it just never really I was you know never really there but when I was 25 I did did you still have the dreams that you had as in you know as in back then it was still professionally you know I might have to do this for a few years or whatever but actually I know eventually I'll get to the stage where you know I will be a professional singer and I will release singles and I will release albums is did you always think I I would still still maybe get there with the right perseverance 100% you can never give up on that 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 dream never goes um because it's so innately down in my soul that <laughs> it w- it was never going to go and fortunately meeting my husband he recognized that you know and I met my husband like mid-20s and you know I just sort of started to to join some bands and try and do some interesting stuff just as I'm talking about my husband guess who's walked in <laughs> can you yeah. say hello to us we have <laughs> we have borrowed his laptop so yeah I've got your laptop was, was he looking for your I laptop was. I was. he was hello. looking <laughs> hi nice to meet you hi. how you doing I'm really yeah, good thanks nice you. to meet you yeah, this is Neil. Hello. Neil, this is Simon. Hi, you looking, would you look at your laptop? I was, or I, looking for, I thought you'd finished. Sorry. No. I'll, 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 come, after. I'll come back out in a second. Okay, Sorry, see. my theme didn't work. No, that's all right. Nice to see you, by the way. Nice <laughs> to see you. It's, let, let him know he's got a cameo appearance now on YouTube. Oh, he's going to be 
Shut that door. <laughs> Cause you've got a cameo appearance. It's going to be like, bring that man back. <laughs> no, he was out and I just took his laptop. So he's probably going to give my laptop gone. <laughs> Wow, he, um, he, he's going to be angry, disappointed with you no, in, an, no, in, in an hour's no. time. <laughs> um, no, he's good as gold. And and that was the interesting thing. You know, my, I'd suppressed my singing. I'd suppressed my performing, my dream, um, and just sort of carried on with working, you know. And each job I got was elevating myself. I was, I was an estate agent, and I was doing really well, you know, earning money that I never earned before you know this was it it was totally different level you know life was very different very very different and um everything changed when i turned 30 that's when it all changed it all up until then i was just sort of plodding along a little bit of singing here the odd band but nothing ever you know really to speak of you know and so what was the what was the big what was the life event at thirty? What why at that stage do you think now it's why did it kick off at that time? My mum died. I lost Gosh. everything. Yeah. Wow. I lost I lost the one person that made everything matter. Mm, I lost I the one person that. that had championed me my whole life. And I lost that one person who knew what it meant for me to do what I needed to do. Yeah. So I felt I owed it to her to, to do it. And so what happened is I got, you know, it was the darkest part of my life, but out of that came this innate drive to succeed. And that is why I am so dogmatic and driven to achieve what I should have achieved so that I could show her, you know, and, that is the force that keeps me going to do it. Yeah. So it's, it's so so with that, it was just gotta gotta do it now. Gotta gotta get on. Gotta make it happen. Gotta be because you. This is a hard industry, like we talked about, and for you to get out there and to sing and everything else, you know, you've got to be you, you've got to be got to work the hours. And a lot of people don't realise the hours you've got to put in in the backgrounds. So you've got to hone your voice. You've got to make the contacts. And there's a lot of hours to put yeah. in but, but at that time then because of your mum passing then you felt like right I've got to I've got to push on now oh my god yeah because I owed it to her that's the that's the thing that was the I didn't owe it to myself I owed it to the person that had sacrificed so much for me to do what I'd already done mm. and I felt I felt like I cheated her I mean, not succeeding because she believed that I would. She always believed that I would. Like it, she was the person that was like, "You was born to do this," and that's where my song "Born a Star" because she always says, "You was born a star," and that's where that all comes from, you know. And you just think, you know, it makes it makes I'm sad, but it makes me cross that she's also the one person that hasn't seen any of it. I was gonna, I'm going to ask, has she seen you perform many times? No. Not at all. Gosh. No, I, I was on the radio for the very first time in the February 2008, and that was with a funk band that I was in. That was my first band function. And we did this um, performance on BBC Six, and she listened to that. Um, and then she died in the March. So literally... And then I had my first release in the February, March, in like the April, something like that. Wow. And it, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's just so, the timing of it is so messed up. But then I also think if I hadn't have lost her, I would have carried on just being an estate agent. Do you, do you really think that? Do you think it wouldn't have come out of you yeah. in that way? I don't think, not with the, not with, not the way that I've done it because I became became possessed <laughs> I think I was possessed I really do believe I was possessed you know mummy's been dead 13 years in March next year mm. and I'm just about to write my fifth album yeah you've that's done so you've done a I'm, you've done a lot in those 13 years that's what I'm saying it's like yeah it's it's I've been so driven and so like monomaniacal about you know where I'm going 
I don't take no for an answer. I haven't waited for people to do it. I've invested totally. I beg, borrowed and steal to make stuff happen, not stolen, that's just a saying, but to make things happen. And I, I wouldn't have done that if she was still here because I would have just enjoyed time with her. It's really, it's, it's, it's like that, you know, if she was here, I wouldn't have done it. She's not here. That's why I've done it. You know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, but I'm, you know, my biggest regret is that she never got to see i mean i performed at the royal albert hall for god's sake yeah. and she wasn't there you know i've performed with a 25 piece orchestra in japan twice she wasn't there and if she was here she would have been with me mm. you know it's yeah it blows my mind what i've achieved but it blows my mind more that she never saw it yeah you know and i just think oh because I know I get so excited watching my son play football. He's played since he was five. And there's, you know, I, I've very rarely have I missed a game to the, to the detriment of my own life because I've just wanted to support him. So I know my mum was just like, I'm just like my mum, sorry. I know that she would have been at every performance. She'd have been up and down the country with me. Oh yeah, she, she'd Definitely. been your biggest fan, singing your name at the very front every time. Gosh. What what were those years like? Once yeah. you once you once your mum passed away, and then you and then suddenly you had, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember the word you used, but when you when you had the the real focus, you know that that innate ability which I've got to make it happen. What then happened from there in the next year or two that really started to get you to play at these some of these bigger venues and those sorts of things? What what start yeah. ha started happening for you? Well, the first year, if I'm really honest, wasn't, nothing happened, you know, um, because grief is not to be played with, you know, and that level of grief, you know, is something else. It's, it's debilitating, you yeah. know, and the, the dark days are more than there are up days. But then eventually you do turn a corner and that's when you're like, okay. And I didn't want to go back to my job and, you know, God bless my husband. He was like, okay, well, what have we got to do? How, you know, and the first four years, not a penny, not a penny. I was singing for nothing all over the place. I was investing. I was paying for, you know, trips to, to just be in the places to meet the people um and then it starts to you know it's years and years and this is the frustrating thing about the pandemic can i just point out this is seven years of and i say seven solid years of promoting pushing social media to get the momentum to have all the bookings you know i lost 25 shows just for the pandemic period 25, wow. shows. 25 shows that's 25 incredible shows from march to to July I've lost 20 that's a lot of shows but they don't just happen overnight they are years of working your way to 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 the promoters so they know that you're a, a solid support act or you know you're their go-to person you build relationships up you know it you don't just get that many bookings and what's going to happen after the pandemic is is that it's not going to be back how it was. So you've got to go through another however many years to get back. You know, it's not going to be as bad because I've, estab I've established myself more. But it's still, it's just as bloody difficult. But yeah, then first, then first few years, you don't get anything, you know. And you put the first album out and, you, you know, you're still scratching a living. And then the second album, it's, it's getting better. You know, this year would have been my most profitable. <laughs> and then what happened <laughs> yeah gosh 25 shows in what 12 weeks it's like every friday saturday night you were, you were booked solid yeah there was bookings every every week um somewhere somehow there was i think about five trips abroad in that as well so because we, i do a lot of my work abroad we should know. talk about that because you, you you have traveled i mean really traveled japan you 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 you've been all over the place traveling we should talk about some of that because some of the videos i've seen you know you're playing some real incredible yeah. venues some 
amazing countries as well. So let's talk about some of your traveling. Yeah. So, so where, where did it all oh, start? Gosh. When was when um, the first time you, you well, started going Japan away? Japan is amazing. Japan, absolutely. I, I, I predominantly used to go to Italy a lot. That was, uh, that was good. Italy was great. Um, I've been to Russia, um, Sweden, Norway, Angola. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still here. I think the lines are sorry. You look frozen. Ah, right. Um, Yeah. I so so you were just mentioning. So we had Rome, Napoli, Angola, Moscow, Croatia, Miami, Germany. Wow. I mean, you've been everywhere. Yes. Japan. Mm. <laughs> I've had, I'm very proud of what I'm about to tell you. And it's not, it's not in any way, shape or form showboating because I is honestly, this is just such an achievement for me to come from where I've come from. You know, we never had holidays, you know, people just didn't go abroad. It wasn't, you know, cause that's expensive and everything else, but I'm now on country number 49 that I've visited. And yes, I am counting them because I am yeah, super proud of that. That, that to me is such an achievement. 49 um, countries. And the fact that I've sung at, you know, 49 countries. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so are I'm they, really are proud they... of that. My dream. Mm. Sorry, go on. So you're, you're saying your dream, your dream, sorry. Oh, my dream is to get to 100 countries. Yeah. Wow. That, that is incredible. So, so when, you, when you're booked abroad, is that to go and do a few different shows or is that a specific show? Is it a tour? How does it, no, I know, I know when you go to Japan, of course, you've just like a, a tour and everything, but what, what are those, 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 those gigs? Oh. I know, was it just one no, show? Both times, yeah, both times I've been to Japan. The first, actually, I've been three times. The first time was for three days, one show. Uh, the second time was four days, two shows. And then the last time was four days, one show. Yeah. And, they, and these must be quite big then. There's a lot of people there. There must be. Yeah, yeah, they're nice shows. It's just, it's just a 14-hour flight to get there. <laughs> 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 and a completely yeah. different time zone as well wow it's a completely different time zone. <laughs> and the first time um i went there we had to we flew into tokyo my best friend came with me as my pa and we had to we was greeted at the airport because driving apparently is really you know it takes a long time so we had to get the train from tokyo uh where was it narita airport into tokyo and we're like on the train like trying to stay awake because our body clocks are all over the place and i had to go straight from there to an album signing at a record store like literally with my eyes <laughs> it was just the most i was like i'm never doing that again i was like coffee just coffee 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 and then we got overtired so we didn't rest and then we went on and did a show in the evening and by the time we got to bed we could only sleep for seven hours because we then had to get up again to go for another meeting and honestly it would i've just never been so tired in my whole life ever but it was brilliant that's incredible that's incredible we we should talk through some of the people that you've worked with because you, you you've worked with some real some some of the real greats so oh, what gosh. yeah um, it, it's pro- probably a hard question for me to say what, what was some of some of your highlights in all those years but but what who would you start to pick out immediately well obviously gladys knight is is on the top she's kind of the pinnacle um my i would i would give anything to meet stevie wonder but i haven't done that yet i've only seen him in concert which was equally as great but i i need i need to see him um i got to open up for eric benet who i've been a fan of like my whole life that was lovely because he's super sexy um (laughs) and he he was married to halle berry and uh, and he actually said, "Oh, you're very similar to Halle Berry." Like, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm not, but I'll take that one on the chin. Take, take, take that compliment. Um, take take it and run. <laughs> take it. I ran with it. No, that was pretty awesome. Um, I've worked with Omar, who 
you know, as a, as a child, I mean, his track is 30 something years old. And I remember as a teenager, it's like, Oh my God, Omar. Um, so we wrote a song together, which is, has been a huge hit for both of us um and he still performs it every time he does the show so that's a huge compliment to me because i wrote all the lyrics so that makes me very happy mm -hmm. um a guy called donny who has been around forever he's lovely we also wrote a really big underground track together which um has done very well for both of us um who else have i um, the fatback band um heather small candy statton lisa stansfield um wow. who else? uh jill scott i mean she's always awesome opened up for her opened up for shaka khan um met shaka khan which was interesting we won't go there and then <laughs> i could that um, in the story there <laughs> <laughs> there's always a story let me tell you there's always a story um i got to open up for the ojs at the theater royal drury lane and then i am um, i've opened up for shalimar now maybe 40 times something like that maybe 40 50 50 times something it's been amazing up and down the country and they are just the nicest bunch and they're like yesterday no sorry on sunday was my mum's birthday and carolyn from shalimar she's like my sister now she calls me up and she's like hey sis how are you you know so yeah they're just i i'm very lucky um alexandra neil opened up for him loads um kenny thomas um gosh this, there's always and what happens and then i remember more and i remember more but um yeah i'm just i i feel very lucky I'm, I'm keeping quiet because I know another one will come in just a second. <laughs> so I know that I know there's so many, there's so many amazing names. Can you can you almost <laughs> believe it when you when you recite names like like you just have and you think five ten years ago before we'd worked with some of these people ten years ago before we'd worked with some of these people that you know fast forward ten years later that this would be the types of people that you're you're rubbing shoulders with you're sharing the stage with you're writing tracks with writing lyrics for. Can, can you believe her last 10 years has all worked yeah. out for you, sort of accelerated? No. No, I can't. And if I'm really honest, you know, I regularly pinch myself regularly because I just think I'll do something and then I'll be like, did that just happen? Or, you know, did I get that phone call? Or did that, you know, just all these different wonderful things that have happened that I am, I'll suck. I'll, I'll say it again, I believe my mum has been the driving force behind all of this, you know. Um, do I wish that there was more? Um, of course I wish there's more, but if nothing else ever happened, I've already achieved more than I thought I ever could on my own, you know. Um, would I would I love to be, you know, number one on the UK charts? Of course. Is it going to happen? Probably not. But, you know, I've got a lovely loyal fan base and I just, I just need more numbers. <laughs> I just need more followers. <laughs> yeah. Um, more people to buy my CDs. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I am so happy with, with where and how it's, it's got. And like I said, if nothing else happens, I've already achieved more than I ever thought. I never thought I'd have an album out. Not one. And I'm now on five. So I'm already winning. Mm we should talk through some of your music i mean i was just i was going through a lot of your music and uh, and it was just what struck me initially natasha was just if you go onto spotify just the yeah. volume the number of songs that you've got that you've written it's i mean it's i'm gonna guess it's over it's well over a hundred i mean that is going at going at a rate i mean i'm only guessing it's over a hundred yeah. I, I, I can't i can't scroll that fast to, to look at them all to, to work it all out but Interesting though is the last album is not on there because I didn't distribute it. I only sold my last album, my next chapter, through my website. Okay. Um, so it's not streamed, and you know I've got mixed emotions about streaming. Um, if it's there, people will just listen without purchasing. I've made more money selling it through my website than I ever could on Spotify. Now that means that it doesn't open up to numbers, but all my previous work is on there. So if people really want to try and find the album, they will find it. It's, I'm not, it's not difficult to find. You just go to my website, natashawattsmusic.com and you can purchase any album. Um, 
you know, I'm not a big enough artist to have all of my music for free. I can't do that because I can't make money. So my live album is not, it's not on Spotify, but I know the Japanese version is on Apple music. Um, so yeah, I just try and keep a little bit back at the moment. And I, th I think I speak to a lot, a lot of artists and it feels like that, that you've, you've kind of got to, because although you know, it's one, one of your songs, your top song has got 94,000 listens, which is an incredible number. Go slow. 94,000 listens. So it's just, it's just you and show me is, is just after that 38,000. But, but, but that doesn't translate. It's not, it's it? not that much though. That's the thing in terms of streaming in terms of, no, oh, I mean, I think I just got my PRS statement and I think on Spotify, from Spotify, I got paid £1.40. Now, on average, every month, I have between four and a half and five and a half thousand streams every month. Right. Did I lose you? You did. We need to pay the internet bill. Did I lose you then, or you? That's no, I, I think I think I got you just a little bit. You said, you, I think you got paid paid a pounds, and I think um, that's because we need to upgrade the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's, you know, so when you look at those numbers, one pound forty for the last three months or whatever it is, um, might even be six months. I, I without looking at the statement, and then you look at the amount, and I get an email every month, so I know. Between, like I said, four and a half to five and a half thousand streams every month, which isn't a lot of streams at all. But if people were having to pay even a penny for that, that would equate to a lot more than one pound forty. Do you see what I mean? Of course, yeah. It's, and it's, it's not point not 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 something per stream. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, but but they're taking their nine ninety nine off everybody every month. And how many, roughly how many subscribers are there to Spotify? Probably quite a lot. Hun, hun, hundred, hundreds of millions, I think now. It's, it's, it's a real, it's so a real it's, big number. It's really sad that now what's happening with music, it's down value. They don't put no value behind our music. If you're an independent artist and I spend five grand making an album, because that's kind of, you know, roughly where you want to be in terms of producing the album, you know, musicians, paying for promotion, all of that, five grand will get you a half decent sounding album. But to make that back on Spotify, you've got to have millions and millions and millions and millions of hits. Mm. As an independent artist, that's not happening. Not for my genre, not for my age, because I'm an, I'm an older artist. And that's not an excuse. It's just the younger people aren't necessarily listening to me. And they're yeah. the ones that are streaming. Whereas getting out and doing shows and getting to the public, I can then sell the world and their, um, their mother a CD. A CD, <laughs> gosh. Wow, a CD. A CD. So that's, that's album number three. Mm. No. Yeah, three. Three. Because this is my best of. And I put that together myself. It's just a collection of all my, you know favorite tracks and i sell that at shows and my older audience still buy cds and they're probably happy to spend 10 pounds probably on that cd which is what you know what we all you know years ago paid 10 15 yeah 10 15 pounds that's what we pay on a cd for sure yeah so what happens then when you put it on streaming they want to sell it for seven pounds they're just downvaluing it more and more. And the sad thing about that is more and more people are listening to more music, but people just won't pay. They're like, oh, no, no, I'll listen on YouTube or I'll, you know, there's just not the, the support. And, and I'm not blaming the public. It's because it's available. If it wasn't available, they'd have to pay for it. But because it's available, but they, you know, the other side of it is they think, well, if you get, if you get enough streams, or YouTube hits, you'll get money. But you, you know, I think my biggest YouTube hit has been only one hundred and fifty thousand. You know, that still doesn't equate to a lot of money. Yeah. So, so if you think about music at the very beginning, you know, nearly getting signed, that could, you know, and that that was very much the approach back at the getting signed, and then you're on to a big deal, and it goes through. And now it's completely different to that. 
yes. right? You know, really yeah. different to how you get out there and social media and gigs. It's just a really different world. What, what do you think's the transition been like that for, for as you say, an independent artist to go through that journey? Huge transition with the internet. Oh and God, that's changed. I like, if I knew the answers to that, I, I would have made it. I think. I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, it's you've just got to keep pushing. You know, if I was a young artist again, I'd, I'd be on the reality shows. I'd be on the TikToks. I'd be, you know, the social media. Now you can go viral by showing your big toe, <laughs> which amazes me. <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying TikTok. I, I'm trying TikTok and Instagram and I'm doing a few things, but you know, it's, it's an independence artist market now because the big record labels don't have to control everything, but it's getting out to enough people that make it financially viable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm, but I'm lucky. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm lucky I am doing this full time. This is my living. Yeah. So I'm all, you know, I'm winning. I make a living. I, you know, I've had a limited company for, for five years now so you know it's it's great and what what does the future hold because now now you're there right you're living yeah. you're quite literally living your dream you've crafted yeah. your sound you've got your audience and i know covid's just happened which has unfortunately affected all of us yes. um but but what what happens next for you for the next few years and where, where are you hoping it can go to because you've again you've played at the albert hall you've played at oh. there are some of the big venues already there's already so many amazing places you've played so, so what can happen next for you where are you really hoping it all goes well i would love to play the albert hall again in my own right with my orchestra that would be a dream come true you know that's that's only five thousand people that's not a lot <laughs> so um much more the same of what i'm already doing i you know i love to perform it's my drug it's my therapy um i'm quite gutted at the moment because i'm not performing um so the sooner i can do that the better i'm i'm just working on songs i've been i've written quite a few songs i've just written a love song that i released and i got all my fans to send in their wedding video pictures or their wedding pictures and that i thought was it was just lovely it's how i felt at the moment i wrote about being in love and being lost in that moment in being in love you know it's and i call it a wedding song because it's probably only on your wedding day that you really feel that in love <laughs> Because then it all changes. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, it's, so check it out. Natasha was in love. I, that's my latest single. Oh, I'll, um, share it. I'll share it after for everyone who's listening. Yeah. I'll, yeah I'll share it. And I'm just enjoying writing in my narcissistic cave. Um, like I said, I'm getting a lot more done. I've got my microphone there. I've got my, my uh, sound card there and, you know, I'm able, I'm, I've taught myself how to record and all of that. Um, I have been working on some other bits. Um, mm. Whilst we've been on lockdown, I have written a children's audio book. Have you really? Um, oh, wow. So, so really different, completely different altogether. I think it's different. I'm going to be launching that in the next couple of weeks. Um, I just had to make sure the copyright was done. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, all the copyright's been done and and very much looking forward to putting that out there because it's something very different um also just been you know working on raising the profile you know with what i do if your profile isn't raised and you're going backwards there's something wrong so i'm i'm trying to look at different ways to keep it interesting whilst we're on lockdown yeah mm -hmm. Have you have you been in lockdown? Has it, and and has that meant you've been able had the ability to write more? And have have you been able to find the inspiration to write more? Because I often think, you know, when when you've got a bit of time of something, you know, obviously we've all been in isolation, but yeah. having that bit of time to go right, I'm going to get some stuff down. I'm going to write some more stuff. Has that been yeah. an opportunity, or is it, or is it actually been a been a hindrance? Been a hindrance. Really? Yeah. Is I've struggled. It's only been in the last few weeks that I've got back into you know. I had a few briefs that I had to do. I, I've written a country and Western song for um, some country guys. I mean, they might not like it, but I, it got me back into the writing mode. Um, and the, literally the last two weeks I've, I've churned out, you know, a few songs, but prior to that, it has been difficult because, you know, this is such an uncertain time. 
and I've really been like, oh, it's been a, it's like Groundhog Day. This is the longest I've stayed in my house. I'm normally, you know, here, there and everywhere. Um, and yeah, I've found that a bit of a struggle. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine it's. I know for a lot of creative people, it really is hard because, of course, you you, you write about inspiration. You know, so you write about things that have either happened to you or other people. Yeah. And of course, if there's nothing going on and you're not experiencing things, then then how do you start writing about stuff? I suppose you have to think really long years ago that that happened, or must be must yeah. become quite difficult in some ways. Yeah, and yeah, like I I was writing something yesterday, and uh, I was sort of something a little bit different. Um, because I do dance music as well and I did this like spoken rap poetry kind of thing and it sounds a bit dark but I was like well obviously that's that's the the place I was in you know um <laughs> and the producer was like oh Natasha where did that come from I was like oh I don't know but it works <laughs> you know but that was the mood you know it it really de- how you write depends on where you are exactly so yeah it's a bit different it's just different simon it really is at the moment but mm. we, we we should explore you, you mentioned uh, electronic music said house music um yes. I'm, I'm sure i'm sure i've a little birdie told me that uh you you uh somebody frequents ministry of sounds <laughs> oh yes darling complete with uh leotarded tasseled up outfits um yeah no a Apparently, my son says I'm not cool, though, but I would say otherwise. I've, I've sung at ministry, and I am very proud of that. <laughs> God, I can imagine. I can imagine you are. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's- Natasha, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Like, it's uh-huh. really, really uplifting and, and such so great to, to hear about the journey that you've been on from, from the very early years. And it's great to just know that you've really committed and followed, followed through on that, on, that, on that promise almost that you had to yourself, that you, you would make it. And um, I just think it's such an inspirational, interesting journey. It really is. really has been good. Yeah. Simon, thank you so much for for taking the time to even want to find out about it. And yeah, listen, if I've inspired anybody to to get up and do something, I think that's, that's a great thing because, you know, I've had lots of people that have inspired me, mostly my mum, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. But, you know, we do need that person in our life that makes us go yeah I want I want to do that I want to be better I want to achieve more you know I want to be and I I wrote a song like years ago actually but I wrote this song about my son and I said I want to be your hero in in the song and I think that's really true I want to be your inspiration and I want to be your hero because that means I'm doing something right you know um and I, I hope that my son picks up on my work ethic and you know my determination you know he's still so young so he's he's got loads to learn but you know I just I want to be that role model for him Mm. I think you already are I think you already are and I'm sure sure he starts listening more to your music (laughs) he's gonna it's gonna see how strong his mum is so I think he's he's got all of that to come yet (laughs) he can't stand my music (laughs) (laughs) let him grow up a little bit (laughs) <laughs> yeah i'm not cool but no listen it's been i've been sort of laying down it's really quite comfortable no it's been lovely talking to you and lovely i wish you. you so much success with your podcasts and you've got such a lovely way about you as well so oh, thank you kind. thank you natasha he's really kind so to, to take us to take us out um yeah we should we you should choose a song maybe one of a song that's important to you or you'd like 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 to be like like your listeners to hear so so what what song if you think about all the hundred or so that you've written um which which (laughs) one would you like to to take us away i am going to request that we play born a star which was the song i wrote for my mom from my eponymous album natasha watts Brilliant. Okay, we're going to listen to that right now. Natasha, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take Take care. care. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.